Please welcome. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Um, I was told uh, to speak from the lectern here, and I think it was so that Yasser can't pass me any of his small notes to tell me to shut up in a few moments. <laughs> um, as, as Yasser said, we, we discovered that we had uh, uh, studied together in the same university at the same time. Um, but uh, also, I think we discovered the fascination we both have for other parts of the world and for, uh, finding ways to understand them. And certainly for me, perhaps the greatest privilege I've had in my working life has been able to be part in a small way of a country like China as it changed and as it developed. And literally from those bicycle sheds, which were actually at the dusty back of the, the British Embassy, through to uh, the sort of operation that we have now in, in China has been an enormous privilege to be part of. But equally, it's an enormous privilege for me uh, as Chief Executive of the British Council, to be able to attend events like this and to be able to have the opportunity to have the conversations with such an extraordinary group of people which we and the people with whom we're working are able to bring together. Because really at the heart of the work of the British Council is our core understanding that it is better to talk than to do anything else. That if we're going to truly find means of understanding each other, the starting point is we have to actually engage with each other. We have to find ways in which we can actually have the conversation. And a conversation is not about talking. A conversation is first and foremost about listening. And one of the key things I think all of us need to do, no matter where in the political dimensions or indeed the cultural dimensions we sit, is find, out, find ways in which we can listen to each other better and absorb the, what we hear in a way which affects how we respond just as much as we hope that the things that we say are going to have an impact on the others. Now, we as an organization over the last three years, few years, have seen enormous transformations around the world, political upheavals, security threats, huge power shifts, um, deep economic and financial challenges. Um, you only have to hear, look at the, the newspapers in this country at the moment to see how much we here have been affected by those. But also during the last decade, debates on migration, social cohesion, and the role of religion in society have revealed deepening social tensions and led to increased polarization in public opinion. Misperceptions, misinformation, particularly when it comes to relations between Muslims and non-Muslims, often dominate public debate. And often it dominates that public debate which is, starts from a point of ignorance, not from a point of knowledge and a point of understanding on each side. On both sides of the Atlantic, dis, uh, divisive controversies over the construction of mosques, the public display of religious signs, contribute to widening that gap of misunderstanding. And the but, not and, but, the community of academics and scholars can make a real difference here. By sharing knowledge, by sharing research with the wider public, you have the power to improve understanding of relations between Muslims and non-Muslims, and you can help bridge that gap between academic knowledge and public perception and public understanding. And it's to support those efforts that the British Council launched our shared Europe four years ago, and since then a huge number of activities have taken place throughout Europe, from academic conferences to media debates, from exhibitions to policy reports. And last year, our second project, Our Shared Future, was created in collaboration with the Carnegie Corporation of New York to build an alliance of academic and thought leaders on both sides of the Atlantic. And we're enormously grateful to Carnegie for working with us on what we believe is a truly important and, uh, and, and effective uh, set of uh, exchanges. This, this event is the result of those two projects coming together. And over the coming months, I very much hope that there are going to be two key outcomes from this discussion and these debates. First of all, I hope that you will continue to build on the links that you've already developed here. Because just spending a few days with each other is not enough. This has got to be the start of a longer term set of exchanges and knowledge uh, uh, sharing. And what you've learned from each other 
can allow you to share your ideas more widely and define the terms of the debate on international issues. The second big aim for us is the hope that the connections and the partnerships that you develop here will provide a strong foundation for collaborations between and with countries in the Middle East and North Africa and the countries here in Europe as well as across the Atlantic. And over the last few years, the British Council has expanded our activities in that region through higher education partnerships, through language training, through leadership build, skills building. We're committed to creating a deeper level of dialogue and collaboration with countries right across the region. And everything that we hear when we talk to people um, across North Africa, across the Middle East, into other parts of the world, what we hear back is this desire from people to be able to be heard, to be able to take part in the dialogue, to be able to take part in the discussions, and to be able to take part in an international uh, set of collaborations. And that really is what all of us here are about, is providing the opportunity for people to take part. And that seems to me to be vitally important. This event also illustrates the importance of partnerships. We feel very, very privileged indeed to collaborate with uh, Hilary Weissner of the Carnegie Corporation, with Yasser, yeah, Professor Yaffa, Yasser Salomon, and the Cambridge Awalidid uh, bin Talal Centre of Islamic Studies. Our partners also include Ed Keisler and the Wolf Institute, um, uh, Professor uh, Anas Al Sheikh Ali and the Association of Muslim Social Scientists, and Professor Hugh Goddard of the Awalid bin Talal Center in Edinburgh. Thank you all of you very much indeed for being part of this collaboration. The objectives of this conference, improving public communications on some of the key issues around the world today, from managing cultural diversity to the role of religion in the public space, is all part of that broader effort to use, I was told to say soft power, but I hate the term. Um, I would much rather talk about cultural relations, which seems to me to be a much more powerful thing for us to talk about than soft power. And that power of cultural relations is a tool for building stability in an increasingly uncertain world. And for me, cultural relations favors persuasion over coercion, dialogue over the use of force, attraction over the power of telling, and most importantly, it puts building trust at the heart of relationships between countries, communities, and individuals. And building that trust using cultural diplomacy to build bridges of understanding is something which I think we need more of, which is probably one of the most important contributions any of us can make to building a safer and more secure world for all of us. I'm grateful to every single one of you for taking part in this conference and these discussions. Um, it is important. I think it is going to make a difference, and we very much hope that as you go out from these few days together, it will be the commitment to building stronger links and stronger understanding between our different communities and societies. So thank you very much indeed for being here. And now I'm going to hand over to Mark Hammond, um, who is our keynote speaker for this evening. And a slight change from your, your, your um, menu. I'm afraid you're going to have to wait for your dessert, because we thought that, first of all, keeping you hungry uh, might be a good thing, but uh, also so that we are able to continue with the, 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 the discussions after, after our speeches. But we are enormously grateful to Mark for uh, coming this evening. Mark represents an organization that focuses its efforts on promoting trust and understanding amongst the diverse communities um, through the Equality and Human Rights Commission. And it's a real privilege to have you here this evening, Mark. Mark joined the commission in June last year after an extensive career in local and central government. He was previously Chief Executive of West Sussex County Council and held a wide range of posts in the British Civil Service including Private Secretary to the Permanent Secretary at the Department of Environment. I'm very much looking forward to hearing Mark speak about managing diversity, protecting minority rights, and promoting intercultural understanding in Britain today. Mark, thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, good evening, everyone. 
Um, let me just briefly echo Martin's thanks to all those who've been involved in the, the events you're involved with in this evening, uh, Corpus Christi, the University, the British Council, the Aula Lead Bin Talel Center, all of you who've contributed to the conference you're attending and tonight's event where you've asked me to say a few words. Um, I do so very much in the knowledge that the wisdom assembled in this room far exceeds my own. <clears throat> I do this in genuine humility, I hope, uh, but in the expectation that I can contribute something to the discussions you're having. Preparing for this evening inevitably led me to reflect that it is almost 30 years since I was a history undergraduate at Magdalen College, Cambridge. That's an amazing thought for me, and I'm sure many of you know what I mean, that it seems both a lifetime away and, and only a moment in time since I was blonde, <laughs> yes, it's true, long-haired and able to sleep till lunchtime because I was studying history rather than a science. <laughs> I, I don't have many opportunities to sleep till lunchtime anymore, and the trouble is even when I do, I find I can't. It does really feel like a different time in so many ways, and yet so eerily familiar in others. I was at Cambridge at a time when a new government had come to power and started making cuts in public spending. At a time when British forces were engaged in a war thousands of miles away. And when we saw riots and violence in the streets of some cities across Britain. In several cases, the disturbances of 1981 were also based in communities with a strong ethnic population, in this case of Afro-Caribbean origin. And if anything was to the forefront of thinking on relations between communities and groups, it was in those areas and in the continuing issues across the water in Ireland. When I try and think back to the student days of the early 80s and how we saw relations between Muslim and non-Muslim communities, I'm afraid what probably stands out is how little thought we gave to the question. I do, however, remember vividly one of the most interesting characters I studied in medieval history. Frederick II, the Holy Roman Emperor, King of Sicily, called by his contemporaries Stupermundi, the amazement or perhaps the astonishment of the world, named by Nietzsche as the first European. Frederick ruled a large part of Western Europe. He fought wars against enemies across the continent, including the papacy. But in his court, based in Sicily, he presided over the, one of the most tolerant societies of that era, perhaps of any era. It included Christians, Jews, and Muslims. He patronized artists and philosophers, and astrologers and astronomers both. He apparently spoke eight languages and appreciated literature and religious texts from all the Abrahamic faiths. Some of this may be exaggeration, but he was a wonderful figure to read about. And if we're looking for some inspiration from history for a better future than our present, maybe he has something to offer. Coming back to Cambridge has also made me think that a generation has indeed passed since I was here. Someone born during my time as an undergraduate would now themselves be coming up to 30, perhaps with a family of their own. For many, probably most of those people in the UK who were in their teens in 2001, one event that September is likely to dominate their understanding and perceptions of Islam and Muslims at home and abroad. That is as much, I believe, a tragic error as for those of us in the 1980s who somehow saw Catholicism as defined by the actions of the provisional IRA. Issues of religion and belief are one of the Equality and Human Rights Commission's particular areas of responsibility and focus. But one in truth where perhaps over our first few years we have not paid sufficient attention. There has perhaps been an underlying sense that at times that if equality's legislation is modern and forward-looking, then religion and belief is somehow slightly embarrassing, too old, too traditional, maybe even too passionate. I want this evening to explain I believe the Commission has three pressing interests in religion and belief and indeed very much in the subject of your event. I hope and I am planning that we will be working harder to deliver progress on all of these in the coming few years. 
perhaps the joint endeavours that this work will call for, can indeed begin tonight. First of all, we have a compelling interest in how people and communities of faith live successfully in a modern, largely secular state and society. How can equalities in human rights both protect people's religion and belief and enable them to live out their faith? Second, that we also have an equally compelling concern for how Muslims, specifically in Britain today, live, learn, work and worship alongside those of other faiths and of none. How can we start to overcome the challenges Muslim communities and individuals face? And third, that we should be supporting opportunities for people of faith to play a full part in the public space of modern Britain. How can religion and belief return to the forefront of civil life and society? The state of religion and belief in modern Britain feels in some ways to be at a crossroads, not just with the coming arrival of a new Archbishop of Canterbury to lead the established church, but with any number of issues and challenges on the role of faith in public life. It seems that almost daily we have to consider how religious belief can accommodate changing social attitudes. On the wearing of religious symbols and clothing which is required by belief. How people of faith can hold to their beliefs and still participate in public life, from running bed and breakfast to giving marriage guidance. And of course, how we face up and tackle the fear and prejudice motivated by misunderstandings of the real shared history and values between Muslim and non-Muslim communities in this country. The Commission is frequently in the middle of these debates and conflicts. Often people expect that we should be seen to take a view, take up a position, support their stand. In fact, of course, that is not our job. We have two specific functions given to us by Parliament. To act as the regulator for the Equality Act, and to advise on the issues of human rights as the body recognised by the UN as our national human rights institution. So the Commission is not here simply to support arguments or take stances. We're specifically not a lobby group or a campaigning organisation, and we're certainly not defenders of any established church or belief. We need to shape our interventions in the context of our statutory roles. But in the context of religion and belief, I think it's right and indeed a duty for us to question how the protections which people of religion and belief should have under the law are actually being implemented in practice. This leads us inevitably into difficult arenas and leads us sometimes to much wider debates about the fundamental nature of faith and belief. Whether faith is an inherent or adopted characteristic of a person's identity. Whether this means that religious rights should have a different level of protection to other rights such as race or gender? How do we resolve issues where honestly and strongly held beliefs come into conflict? The Commission also has to deal with the fact that in some cases, for some religions, their view of other people can be seen as intolerant. So some Protestant sects do not accept homosexuality is either innate in human nature or acceptable behaviour in practice. Some religions are perceived not to value equally the rights of women. And some religions, such as that of a possible Republican candidate for president, would advocate traditions like polygamy. A modern Western society with laws around equality is unlikely to accept that in public life these beliefs can be put into practice. And increasingly, we believe, there is going to be pressure on how far society and governments are going to be willing to stop at the temple door and allow religions or any other private institution to practice in private what would not be accepted in public. On too many cases, it seems to me that court judgments and the media response to them show a lack of consistency and a marked unwillingness to engage with the principles which underlie the positions they take. So according to what media you read at times, Muslim girls should not wear religious clothing at school, but BA workers must be allowed to wear crosses at work. Churches should not perform same-sex marriages, 
but councils must be allowed to hold prayers before meetings. These are difficult and important issues, but I think we must see a more informed, patient and tolerant debate on how to resolve them. Recently, for example, the Commission has been approached to consider the issue of religiously slaughtered meat, kosher and halal, and whether it should be labelled as having been killed in those ways when it's then sold on the open market. Some groups object to the way animals are killed in these manners and want to be able to avoid buying meat from those sources and so demand the labelling. Is that right? Should people be able to make that choice? What impacts would that have on halal and kosher butchers who depend on sales to the wider market? These are the sort of issues I'm afraid cross my desk on an almost daily basis. And in considering all these questions and challenges, I think we've rightly concluded we need from the Commission to create a much closer and broader relationship with communities of faith and with those of no faith. It's not good enough for us to sit and muse in our ivory tower. We need to build partnerships with everyone, even those who may hold views which are difficult to accommodate in the current legal framework of equality and human rights. So my first conclusion is very much that in order to deal with the issues and challenges of religion and belief in a modern Britain, the Commission, we need to be more active, more outward looking, to help create the partnerships and alliances which can tackle difficult questions. Without that dialogue and understanding, progress and resolution will be impossible. The fundamental elements of this dialogue and engagement must be respect for pluralism and diversity. Cultural diversity is indeed a positive thing, as the world would have been extremely dull if we were all the same. In protecting and advocating our own different traditions and customs, we celebrate the greatness and strength of our common humanity. Pride in one's culture cannot be allowed to ignite prejudice or to encourage polarization. The ultimate goal of dialogue should not be to change the other, but to coexist peacefully with the other. As I believe it says, you shall have your religion and I shall have my religion. I don't think you have to be a historian or a political scientist or any kind of specialist to be worried that at times the level of political and public discourse we've reached is concerning. Fact and knowledge are no longer always the foundations of argument, just optional extras. It seems to me, looking from outside, that the history and reality of Muslim communities in this country is one of those areas where myth trumps truth. It's very presumptuous of me to suggest I know anything about what it's like to live as a Muslim in Britain. But I perhaps have the small advantages that my own heritage is also not from an established church. My father was a Methodist minister, descended from the insurgent priests who challenged the Church of England 150 or so years ago. My wife's family are Norfolk Catholics, used to hiding their faith and practice in years gone by. So I can perhaps appreciate something of how a community deals with interactions with the state and society from a different point of view. Perhaps the earliest encounter I've found between Britain and Islam is not in the 20th century or the 19th, not even the letters Elizabeth I sent to Turkey at the times of the Armada, but goes back to the 8th century to King Offa of Offa's dyke fame, the Anglo-Saxon King of Mercia, who minted some gold coins with Arabic inscriptions on them. They are still in the British Museum and carry the inscription, there is no God but Allah. Nobody is, as I understand, quite sure why or what the origin of these coins were. Did someone at Offa's court convert? Did he have trade with Muslim countries? Was there an honored Muslim visitor? It certainly demonstrates for me that our shared story is far older than reported or understood. Despite revisionism in some quarters, we also know well that the knowledge of the great civilizations of early Europe only survived the Middle Ages through the learned and sophisticated communities of Muslim Europe. In the 19th century, Muslims from Africa, the Indian subcontinent, the Middle East, not only traded with this country, but started to settle here. There are Muslim communities of which many hear little, but which have been here far longer than many would believe. The long-settled Yemeni community in South Shields descended, it's thought, from Yemeni sailors 
who arrived in Britain shortly after the opening of the Suez Canal. Today, as many of you know well, there are few areas of the economy or society where Muslims and gen generations have not made their mark. Shopkeepers, teachers, doctors, factory workers, scientists, engineers, everywhere across our society and economy, the Muslim communities make their mark. There cannot be any serious dispute at the benefit Britain has had from the Muslim heritage it has enjoyed for so long. The positive links those communities have with other Muslim countries and communities around the world is one of those areas I feel we can build greater bridges on the basis of our shared history. So in spite of any current tensions, I know we can still benefit and will benefit from the shared history we have. So how can we increase understanding of that shared history, the real history, the real story, and the contribution of Muslim communities in Britain? I hope it will be partly answered by my first premise of more active and constructive partnerships, and partly by my final point about the role of faith in public life and the public space of modern Britain. There is a view which has merits that the broad answer to the problems of religion and belief in public life is the temple door response. The argument that in order for communities of faith to hold to their beliefs, they must recognize they can hold on to what happens inside the temple or the mosque door, but not seek to apply it to the world beyond. This approach is not without its supporters, and as you may know, has parallels in the history of Islamic communities in different countries and times, when the best choice appeared to be for Islam to become a private faith without a public face. It also has some sense for those of us who administer the law in that it's tenable and consistent. In the face of continued pressures from those who would happily burst down the door and seek to regulate everything which lies within, it is an approach which may have to be part of the overall answer. But I feel it's far from a complete answer. It pens faiths inside those temples when there is so much more they can contribute to public life. So I believe we must strive for more. The values and examples of people of faith and what they can contribute to a public sphere which is cynical, disenchanted with politics, in need of leadership and values which chime more closely with the challenges and pressures of people's own lives. To desire indeed a land of security and a land of justice. For me then the answer may lie also in the tenets of so many faiths where public good works and holding power to account are part of faith and a central power of religion and belief. We need, I think, to learn from the tragic events of last summer and the sacrifice of young men in Birmingham standing up for their community and for their area. That is the way we can change the misleading narratives that too many people have had thrust upon them. The active contribution of the Muslim communities in public life can contribute to reversing the tide of fear and misinformation. I believe the power of religion and faith is not dependent on its establishment in the state or even on the relationship between civil law and religious law. The power of the moral example translated into the ethical life of the community is a transformative power. And over time, it can indeed change the laws which reflect and lead society's views. There is an old saying along the lines that for evil to triumph, good people must just do nothing. I think we need a modern version. Something like, for society to go downhill, people of faith and goodwill only need to stop talking to each other. The common good of society is a shared ambition, and we can all encourage the merciful, compassionate and kind, and speak against the unfair and the discriminatory. We may not see a return to the court of Frederick II, but we can go forward to a society where those who strive for the same values of tolerance, generosity, charity and respect are united by those common values and not divided by beliefs. And in that spirit, let us all go forward and truly vie with each other in doing good. Thank you.